Colleagues, today we are in the Education Committee meeting. My name is Deirdre Bartman, Chair of the Committee meeting. Today we are dealing with the briefing from the National Minister of Finance, or in this case today, the National Treasury on the for the Committee on the Budget, the proposed costing and funding of the Basic Education um, Amendment Laws Bill. It is the current education bill that is before us, and essentially this meeting stems from previous resolutions from the committee. It stems from various sections in the PFMA and the constitution relating to unfunded and funded legislative mandates, relating to the effective and efficient um, allocation of funding. It relates to equitable share in this regard, and it also relates to the origin of this meeting where the official Mr. Lebe from the Department of Education indicated that National Treasury has committed to funding the respective um, bill. So members, I'm just going to ask that you please introduce yourselves and then I'm going to um, just table some apologies and then I'll hand over, uh, then I'll do the introductions from the Department um, of the National Treasury and then we will jump straight into the respective presentation which has been sent to us. Deirdre Bartman, Chair of the Committee. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Christopher Fry, member of this committee. Morning. Morning, everybody. Wanrapu, member of this committee. Morning. Um, and then I know we have an apology from the National Minister of Finance. And then Mr. Daza, if you can just quickly table the other apologies you receive from members. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair. We've got an apology from member Christians and also from member Said Khalid Said. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. And I know member Bosman will be joining us a little bit late, but he is an um, he's an alternate member and um, not one of the permanent members. Um, since we have quorum, we can thus continue. Um, I can just hand over to the National Treasury for the lead to introduce the delegation, please. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. My name is Julia De Bruyne from the National Treasury. Myself and Spencer Gennari work in the Public Finance Division. And with us today are three colleagues that work in the Intergovernmental Relations Division. Ogali Letsing Gharikwe, Mandla Gobian, and Pongani Daka. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I have noted the apology from the Minister of Finance. Um, so I think those are all the apologies. You can then just jump straight into the presentation. It has been sent to members. I will then open up for questions and answers afterwards. Thanks, Chair. Um, can uh, Spencer Gennari be given permission to share the presentation from his side? And then just to say, Chair, we made some slight amendments on slide six. Uh, we've added a, an additional sentence there. Um, and I've asked our parliamentary people to forward the updated presentation to yourselves. But the rest no of the problem. presentation is still the same. Uh, no problem. MS Teams, you don't need permission oh, to you share. Don't need permission. You go to, okay. Yes, there's a okay, little no, share thanks. button next to the leave button. I'm not sure if you can see my screen. Um, yes, we, we can, can, but, but it's, it's, it's giving me tools now. Yeah, <laughs> but now you've got the MS Teams, Vincent. Yes, because I had to come back to the mic. So perhaps just minimize your MS team um, and keep the slide open. There we go. Okay, then let's proceed, Chi. Um, 
So just to say the short, the actual short answer to the question that was raised in the invitation. I mean, we'll take you through the, the presentation, but the short answer is that no additional funding has been proposed for the implementation of the bill. There is funding in the baselines of provincial education departments for grade R, but it is clearly not sufficient. Um, and so our presentation will just focus on how the budget process works and then reiterate those comments again at the end. So in the presentation, Spencer, the presentation's disappeared now. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, let me just get it back. Okay. There you go. Is that fine? Yes, that's fine. Okay. So just to the next slide and then we can proceed. So in the presentation today, I will cover um, a quick view of the budget process, including the consultation process before the division of revenue is tabled, then some aspects of the division of revenue, and then some comments in relation to the bailable. So this is a rather busy slide, but it kind of captures all the players in the budget process. Uh, on the left hand side in the grey bar, that is where the National Treasury does its work. We are the technical preparers of the budget. Uh, there are other role players also on, on the left. The FFC is a integral part and works alongside us throughout the budget process. We also take into account any parliamentary recommendations that have been made. Uh, as well as what is called the mandate paper, which comes from the presidency, which sets out the priorities of government for the years going forward. As the budget is a legislative mandate, because it is a law, there's the interface with the political meetings across the top in the purple bar. Uh, we have the Budget Council, for which for this committee would be the main um, political spot because that has the Minister of Finance as well as the nine MECs of Finance. And then in order to bring in local government, we have the Budget Forum, which is that same Budget Council, plus the South African Local Government Association. All of that filters through to the Minister's Committee on the Budget, which is a subcommittee of Cabinet at the national level. And then when discussing the budget, there is an extended Cabinet meeting, which includes um, the Premiers of the provinces. In other words, the National Treasury makes proposals to the political level, and the political level makes the decisions on behalf of the executive. Those decisions then get fed into the legislature and the Minister of Finance does that on behalf of the executive. So we have an, an annual calendar which runs pretty much as it states below there. The, we table the MTBPS, the Medium Term Budget Policy Statement in October. Uh, and that's important because at that stage already there is a proposal for the division of revenue and any substantive changes to conditional grants. Then there are parliamentary hearings and recommendations on the medium term budget policy statement. Then it goes back to the forums, Mincombard Budget Council, Budget Forum and Cabinet to indicate if there are any changes they would like to bring to the proposals. And then finally on budget day, alongside a, a large set of documents is also tabled the Division of Revenue Bill for the legislature's consideration. 
as I understand it, Chair, um, I think the National Treasury will be in the Western Cape Legislature next week. Um, my colleagues from IGR can just confirm uh, to take the legislature through the Division of Revenue Bill. So this is just a highlight uh, because that's not the topic for today's conversation. So just briefly, the transfers to provinces for the service delivery consists of the provincial equitable share, as well as the share of conditional grants. Um, and so in the table there, we've just highlighted in green. In terms of the division of revenue, there are allocations to national departments, then there are allocations to provinces, and the equitable share amounts are listed there, as well as the conditional grant amounts, and then there's the share for local government. At the bottom of that table, you can see how the shares have changed over time, but roughly in kind of on the margin, the percentages are, if you take, let's just take 24, 25, because that's a year we'll be talking about, 48.5% at national, 41.7% at province, and 97 of nationally raised revenue. Provinces have their own revenue sources as well, and so does local government. In the green part of the table, uh, you can see that the provincial total transfer is growing by 3.8%. The equitable share grows by 3.9% and the conditional grants grow by 3.7%. And part of the reason why the equitable share is growing a little bit more than the conditional grants is because there were additional allocations for the education health carry through cost of the 2023 wage agreement. Then from the total equitable share to provinces, the, that has to be divided then into for the nine provinces. So the transfers in total account for 97% of provincial revenue. Uh, so in other words, the major portion of what provinces have to develop their budgets on comes via the provincial equitable share. It's distributed via the provincial equitable share formula. And if we look at the table, that results in the Western Cape receiving 62.1 billion in 2024-25. And the total conditional grants for the Western Cape is 14.9. So the total transfers is 76.9. So on to our comments in relation to the Bella Bill. Once provinces have an indication of their provincial equitable share, that is the 62 that was on the previous slide, each province runs their own provincial budget process that is led by the provincial treasury. Via that process, and we do the same at national, we, we will propose funding for the provincial departments in our case, the national departments, including that of the education department. The provincial legislature will allocate that funding once they pass the provincial appropriation bill. And in our case, the National Assembly will allocate funding to national departments once they pass the appropriation bill. So the National Treasury, in this case, has no power to propose any earmarking of funding within the provincial equitable share. That is styled in entirely a provincial process. And so to reiterate what I said at the beginning, in this budget process, no additional funding was proposed for the implementation of the Bella Bill in the 2024 budget. The additions that were proposed in the 2024 budget were mainly for education and health for the carry through costs of the 2023 wage agreement. Then this is the sentence we added just to confirm that funding for grade R as tabled in the nine provincial legislatures in current provincial education budgets, a 
amounts to 6.5 billion for 2024-25, which covers about 70% of the grade R cohort. And that is it, Chair. We've added just two slides. Just go further on, Spencer, please. Just to give an indication um, of the Western Capes allocations over the MTF. So you see again the 62 in the green bar and the 14. And then there's a further exposition of the 14 of the conditional grants and which conditional grants are in which sectors. Um, and they cover about eight of the of the departments. So agriculture all the way down to transport. That's just for information purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, colleagues. Um, I'm going to open up the questions, uh, questions and answers session now. Before we get to that, um, I just want to check Ms. Um, De Brain. Is there a particular reason that the minister was not able to join us? Um, I'm assuming that was in the apology letter. I am. I don't know why. No problem. Uh, maybe Mr. Daza can just check on, on that letter while I do the question and answer session then. OK, colleagues, I'm opening up for questions now. I see Member Fry's hand. I don't see any other hands, so I'll then go off to Member Fry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know that um, we've done extensive uh, hearings and extensive consultations on this bill. Um, so I just want to be clear, and, and I stand to be corrected, but basically we're saying that there's, there hasn't been any money allocated or provided for, for, the, for this bill in the 2024-25 budget cycle. The provinces are left to their own devices, and we don't actually know what the actual cost of this bill is going to be right now. So the provinces are just are just having to find some place to get a blank check. I just I stand to be connected, but I think you know just for just for record purposes, I I, I would just like a, a guidance on that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. I'll then pose my questions. Um, I won't pose all of them at once, as some of them will be moot depending on the previous answers. So I think I happen to be in a lucky position that I'm also chair of budget, so I know of Dora coming up. I've seen Dora's documentation, the, the bill so far, and it's public documents. There's nothing in Dora, obviously, on Bella or the implementation of Bella. Now, the national budget is essentially, in simple terms, a three-year budget plan. And every year, the national government updates that plan. And in an ideal world, provinces, provinces should never be shocked at what we're going to get in the outer years. And then as a province, we plan our provincial budget and provincial programs accordingly. And it doesn't only happen in the Western Cape, it happens in every province. And the budget is law. I think some people forget the budget is an actual law that gets tabled. It comes to parliaments. Parliaments have to consider it and give our input. And then the budget becomes law. So if you don't budget for Bella, then it essentially means National Treasury does not intend on funding it for at least the next three financial years. So the fact that I haven't seen it in the current 2024 DORA, which includes the 2024 financial year, the 2025 financial year, and the 2026 financial year, means that for the next three financial years, National Treasury, to date, as we are sitting here, does not intend on funding it. And that is up until the beginning of 2027. So now my question is, so, so obviously we now have confirmation that Bella is not budgeted for. But now my question is, did National Treasury commit to funding the Bella Bill? Thank you. I don't see any other hands. Um, oh, Mr. Uh, Member Poole, and then I'll hand over to Mr. Brain. Thank you, Chair. Chair, my concern is provinces all over South Africa already 
prepared their budgets for the 24-25 uh, book year. And since the National Treasury Judge Committee uh, confirmed that there is no budget uh, for Biala Bill in, uh, in the 24-25, now my concern is uh, how do the provinces, uh, after they already plan the budgets for 24-25, how will they get uh, sufficient funding for the Biala Bill? Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Brown. I suppose the questions are actually more about what are the priorities of government? And in the mandates paper, that is where the priorities of government actually arise. I think I have to remind honourable members that the 2024 budget was a budget around fiscal consolidation. In other words, funding was removed from the baselines across national, provincial and local. So in that instance, it's not about the, what, what the National Treasury wants. That was the framework within which the budget took place. And the only money that was made available was to, in order to do the carry through cost of the wage bill. So it is not it is not for the National Treasury to say, because uh, we don't make the budget, we make we make proposals. And cabinet says they are either happy with these proposals or they're not happy with these proposals and they change them. And we are the ones that come and present, but we are not the decision makers of how much money gets allocated to what. And so I suppose the way I would think about it is there are many items that need to be funded, and that's a list as long as one's arm. And it's about the choices that get made at the political sphere about what needs to be funded and what doesn't need to be funded. That is where the questions should be directed. In our, in our case, and I'm sure that's the same case for the Western Cape Legislature, Parliament has the power to amend the budget. And so we bring the proposals and the legislature must say whether they want to approve that as it is or whether they want to make any changes. So all I'm saying is that from the technical side of the budget, there were no proposed additional allocations for the implementation of the Bella Bill. Thanks. My colleagues may want to add, um, Ohali, Mandla, Bongani Spencer. I see Mr. Mueli's hand is up. I'm not sure if he's also from National Treasury. Mr. Mueli. So, good morning, Chair, and uh, good morning to members of your committees and colleagues. I'm from Basic Education Chair. Uh, I'm not from National Treasury. No problem. I saw Mr. Ndlebe also in the meeting, so I, I didn't know other education persons were also joining, but you can go ahead. No, Chair, thank you for the privilege. I just wanted to clarify, um, and, and I, I, I agree with the presentation made by National Treasury. What the Bella Bill is, proposed, is proposing is not fully funded. As they've indicated in their presentation, the funding is on the baseline of PED's equitable share. Some of the money is with DBE, for instance, we fund LTSM in the form of workbooks, providing all 22,000 uh, schools and centers with grade R with LTSM. So there's no legislation in basic education that is 100% funded. Even the Bella Bill will not be 100% funded. 
Uh, for instance, the uh, uh, South African Schools Act itself, norms and standards for school funding, you go to all the nine provinces, you'd find that because of the consolidation of the fiscus, some of the provinces are unable to meet the norms in full. So the notion that uh, for the Bella Bill uh, to be enacted, it's got to be fully funded. I have not found it with any legislation in basic education where any legislation receives 100% funding. And therefore, the 70% that is on the baseline of PED's equitable share, plus what is funded for in terms of the workbooks for uh, grade R, uh, that's what is available. As uh, uh, Mr. Brain has indicated, that's what government is able to afford now. Uh, and I fully agree, it's not 100% funding of the Bella Bill, uh, but as she indicated, Great R is already funded at 70%, plus the allocation that's provided for, for workbooks, which comes through DBE, direct to schools. I just thought that I must make that clarity. But also, uh, Chair, you'd recall that there's budget adjustment during uh, the financial year, and the baseline uh, also gets um, amended or adjusted from time to time when the fiscal announced, I mean, allows. It doesn't mean that. I agree with you that uh, our funding is for three years, but it doesn't mean that if there's no funding now, there won't be funding for the next three years. Uh, thank you. Okay, Mr. Mweli, um, in terms so you're saying that if Bela is passed, you want provinces to take it from its equitable share? Mr. Mueli, I see I have some provincial treasury people in the meeting as well. So I think they would be very interested in knowing since previously we were told we we're going to get money for public wages and we didn't get everything. So I'm not sure if they are having sleepless nights at what you just said. Is it true that you're saying now that if Bela gets passed, you want provinces to take it from its equitable share funding? Well, that's what they've been paying salaries for great R practitioners and great R teachers for, from the equitable share. It would not only come as a result of the passing of the Bela bill, it's been happening for years. And what is needed is the 30% that National Treasury indicated but at the moment, the baseline is at 70%. And you are right, Chair, even in terms of uh, improvement of conditions of service, that's what would happen, and it's been happening for all these years. Treasury would say, what is available is this much, the difference, you'd have to work it out from uh, the allocation that is available. Mr. Mwili, I just want to check with you. So your answer is yes, you want provinces to take it from the equitable share. It's either yes or no. Either we mustn't take it from the equitable share for provinces, or we must take it from the equitable share. Chair, the baseline is already from the equitable share. Augmenting the 70% with 30%, it would obviously come from the equitable, it would have to come from the equitable share, you're right. Okay, so you're saying yes, if Bela is passed, you want provinces to take it from the equitable share. Okay, then I just want to check, not all of the questions were answered. Um, mine on did National Treasury commit to funding the Bela, which is a very different question to whether or not Bela is currently funded. So I need to know, did National Treasury commit to funding the Bela Bill? Because in previous meetings on this bill, on multiple times, DBE claimed that National Treasury, quote, committed to funding the Bella Bill. And that's a very different question to whether you are currently going to fund it or not. So I just need a yes or no. Did National Treasury commit to funding the bill? Mr. Brain? Chair, the, the answer is no. Because it's not only no for, 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 the, for the implementation of the Bella Bill, it is no for everything. The Treasury does not allocate funding. Therefore, the Treasury cannot commit 
to anything. Not, not, um, not to 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 fund roads, not to build a dam. That all list rests with the legislature. Only the legislature can allocate. I do not have the power to allocate, therefore I do not have the power to commit. What I can tell you, Chair, is that in budget engagements with the National Department of Basic Education, we have discussed this matter along with all other funding requests around ECD, around infrastructure, around additional teachers, around the three streams model. We've had long discussions on this. It doesn't mean if we've had a discussion in a budget meeting that we have confirmed anything. And so the answer is no, but not only no for that, but no, because we cannot confirm. I would be, it would be remiss of the National Treasury and they would com be completely overreaching the, the function and mandate to, to, to make commitments when we don't have the power to commit. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see Mr. Lebe is in the meeting. Mr. Lebe, you have on multiple occasions. Are you? Let me just check if you are online or perhaps I'm a radio in the background. I am online, Chairperson. Morning, Mr. Lebe. Mr. Lebe, this is very. This is a very important question because on multiple occasions, and it's not just me saying so. Anyone who can go through the committee YouTube videos and online recordings and resolutions and and minutes and even the documents on PMG where they also independently draft up what we're saying in committee meetings can confirm this. On multiple times in these committees, you have indicated National Treasury committed to funding the Bella Bill and you were quite adamant about it. So I just need to understand what was the reason that you believed National Treasury committed to the funding of the Bella Bill? Did someone tell you, I am committing to funding it? Did you get a letter? Did you get a memo? Where did that come from? Because clearly, National Treasury has not committed to funding the Bella Bill. Chairperson, I'll take you to the very last meeting that we had with, with the committee, where we projected a letter from National Treasury that was directed to the National Assembly. And the letter was indicating that the Department of Basic Education has fulfilled all the requirements of dealing with an unfunded mandate and how the unfunded mandate comes into play is that it goes through a sales process, which was then approved uh, in, in the sense that there is a certificate that, yes, we have played the game by the rules. Now, National Treasury, in accepting that we have done what was expected in following procedures, in dealing with unfunded mandate, that is how the bill ended up in Parliament. If there was no commitment from ourselves on how this bill needs to be funded and how it's supposed to be in dealing with unfunded mandates, then the bill would have been sitting in Parliament, it would have been discussed. So our understanding of those decisions uh, Mr. Lebe, I think there's some music in your background. Maybe if you can just um, pause that for a while. No, it's gone, Chairperson. So in, in our case, we're saying we, we, we submitted what was required. And we have put it with the expectation that it is Parliament that is going to play around the budget. And it is Parliament, if they approve the bill, that will have those discussions, as Treasury has indicated, that it is the politicians that play around and shift the budget around. So if they do pass this, they'll be passing it with the understanding that it has financial, uh, um, I mean, uh, expectation, and that has not been budgeted for before. But we, we also need to add, Chairperson, uh, as the Director General has, has reported, that. The funding that we're talking about here is a 30 percent 
And one might ask us, the amount that is indicated in the documents now, these are amounts that were done probably six years back because this, but this bill has been in parliament forever. And things have changed since then because where we are, it's no longer those amount of billions that are required in order to ensure universal coverage of grade R. Grade R is happening, it, it's going on at that 70% funding. And, and our understanding is that if the parliamentarians in, in parliament are going to pass this bill, they will know that there is an obligation of looking at the budget and playing around with the budget. And we're looking at 2024, 2025 budget that, that is currently under discussion. And for grade R to be universal doesn't really depend on this year's financial year. We don't know when the bill will be passed. And if it passed, we are in the middle of the year. It can be that uh, we were going to immediately uh, use the, 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 the funding that is expected in the middle of the year. It will still go through the processes of a, a financial year and, and the budget and the midterm reviews and all those type of things. That, that, that is our expectation. But from Treasury, what we know is that we followed the rules of applying for an unfunded mandate. And they confirmed that we have applied and we followed the, the right channels in doing so. And that's where we are, Chairperson. Thank you. I'm going to open up for other hands before I take my other questions because I still have a few. Is there any mem uh, members still? Okay, I will then continue with mine. So, this 30 percent, to put this into context, the bill, the actual bill in its financial implications is asking for essentially 17.7 .7 billion rand. Now, let's assume if you divide that by nine provinces, that is 1.97 billion. Let's, let's say 2 billion. And it's not going to be 2 billion because in the previous meetings, DBE has confirmed that there are things that have not been costed, multiple things that have not been costed. Not only have those multiple things not been costed, things such as ablution facilities, things such as nutrition, things such as increased transport, et cetera, assistive devices, et cetera, et cetera. Not only has that been costed, but the current 17.7 .7 billion rand is based on a calculation of one teacher and 40 students, okay? one teacher and 40 students, which is not sufficient, which means every province at its very minimum will likely end up spending more than 2 billion rand. I see provincial treasuries in the meeting, so I, just want to quick, I know we did not invite them, but I'm sure that they're very interested in today's meeting. I just want to check Ms. Speak. Um, I don't see anyone else. Are, are you online or am I, am I radio in the background? I know sometimes some officials from different departments um, listen to meetings that they're not needed for, but um, they're interested in such meetings. Uh, good morning, Chairperson. Um, yeah, no, we are we are in the meeting. We we um, I'm well aware we were not invited, but as you say, um, as you said, we're very much interested. But also, it's a protocol um, for us in the Western Cape when the National Treasury gets invited to any standing committee. We then also. Um, we are also present then um, in the meeting. Okay. Ms. Speak. So we all know in terms of the PES, we got 62 billion rand from national that they're proposing in Dora. Then we got 14.8 in terms of conditional grants, which brings us to 76.8. If I remember correctly, because I don't have all my budget documents in front of me, I only brought my education stuff with me today. The provincial budget is 84 billion. So when the Treasury and DBE says no, but provinces also have their own revenue streams, they're actually talking about this other 7.2 billion rand that we are that we are putting into the budget in order to get us to 84, which is not even 10%. So essentially all provinces are funded by the national treasury. And in our case, we are funded more than 90% by the national government. Now there's nothing in the Dora speaking about Bella. 
Ms. Pick, does the pro provincial government have a minimum of 2 billion rand to implement Bella? Uh, Chairperson, um, I think in terms of when we presented the 2024 budget, um, you uh, to the to the budget committee, um, you would uh, you would know that we'd never um, actually indicated any allocation um, for the the Bella bill. Firstly, um, secondly, also then in terms of um, the the two billion that you are speaking about at this stage. I mean, I think the treasury also then tabled. Um, if you're asking if there's anything, any other funding that's available within the fiscus about for the two billion rand, that would be only then in terms of um, what we have set aside for unforeseen and unavoidable um, uh, allocations over the MTF that adds up um, to almost in terms of about two billion. But that's that's um, that's it, right? Robins. And that adds up to approximately two billion. Uh, that's correct. That's about in terms of just, it's just under because it's about plus minus uh, 600 uh, million rand per annum per year. So um, that does then add up in terms of about 1.8 billion rand. But that's over the MTF, not per year. That's over the MTF um, chairperson. So we don't actually have 2 billion rand per year for Bella. We don't have six essentially. No, we don't. No, we do not have six billion rand in the provincial kitty. And to my understanding, the unforeseen and emergency reserves are for unforeseen and emergency matters. And something like Bela is not unforeseen or unplanned or an emergency. Unforeseen and unplanned emergencies are things like fires and floods and COVID and load shedding, blackouts and locusts. Those are more or less the type of things that unforeseen is planned for. Am I correct? That's good, Chairperson. Okay, so we do not have two billion rand for Bella every year. Even if it was over the MTF, it would then mean that for the next three financial years, there must be no fires in the Western Cape, no floods, no locusts, no COVID 2.0 or 3.0, no load shedding blackouts, nothing. Everything in life must be perfect in order to be able to fund Bella, which we would still not have enough money for. Okay. Mr. Lebe, you indicated, okay, this question is actually not for Mr. Lebe. Mr. Lebe indicated that the CS process was done, it was approved, a certificate of CS was given, and he said, now we submitted what was required. Mr. Brain, I just want to find out when it is said we submitted what was required in terms of the CS requirements. To my understanding, that is also not a confirmation that National Treasury will commit to the funding. Am I correct in that regard? Uh, yes, Chairperson, the CS is a process that is run by the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, not the National Treasury. I think the, there may be some confusion in respect of the Section 35 of the PFMA. So section 35 of the PFMA is what Mr. Ndlela is referring to. That section says, and it's not, it doesn't come to us. That section says when a, a department tables legislation that is going to bring about an obligation in terms of provinces, when it tables that legislation, it must table the costing. So the only thing that we were confirming is that the National Department of Basic Education had to do the costing. It is not the job of the National Treasury. So, so I just want to clear that up. We do not approve the costing. We do not. The costing goes with the bill to the legislature. And because the legislature, in the case of the National Assembly, had written to the National Treasury to ask us to please come and present the costing, that is when we had to remind the National Department that the costing belonged to them. It's not our bill. The Bella bill is not our bill. So the Treasury doesn't do anything except remind you of what your mandate is in terms of the PFMA in this regard. 
So we could never have given any confirmation of any sort, except to say, well, they did present the costing, because we were then repeatedly asked to come and present the costing. In fact, yourselves had also asked us to come and present the costing, which we then said again, it is not our function to present the costing. It is the function of the National Department. So no, we, we and that is why I will repeat, we will never confirm um, things that are not in our mandate to confirm. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Brain. Mr. Mwele. No, thank you, Chair, for the privilege again. Well, I agree, maybe the, there's a technical misunderstanding. The appropriation is not done by National Treasury uh, that we accept, is done elsewhere, is done by legislatures, uh, national legislatures, uh, and of course uh, the executive councils. But Chair, what I thought also uh, I had attempted to clarify, the, the bill is not fully funded, but what we are dealing with, which is about making great R, a compulsory uh, grade like uh, all other grades from grade uh, one up to grade seven, is that whether the bill goes through or not, grade R is being provided for in schools and it's funded at 70%. And to get the bill through would really help uh, indeed to move grade R to be in line with the rest of the other grades that enjoy, um, you know, compulsory uh, school which could get even the same, if not uh, more attention than grade one to grade seven. And, and I wanted to correct the notion that says the, the, the bill is not funded at all. It's not true. 70% is already in the system, but the bill is not fully funded as the Treasury has also indicated. And the gap that I think we, um, uh, we are dealing with is the difference between what is available now and what would make um, the bill fully funded. But I want to repeat, I'm yet to know of any bill that is 100% funded. But I do take your concerns as the Western Cape province that you don't have additional money that would make up for the 30%. Thank you very much. Mr. Mwele. I'm, I'm going to make reference to some previous meetings now quickly because you speak about the 70% and the 30% and so on. So I'm going to make reference to previous meetings and I'm going to make reference to facts that are not my facts, facts that were presented by the DBE, okay, and also by the FFC. Now, the Western Cape Provincial Parliament, for, for those who might not know, is actually the first parliament through this education committee to call the FFC on a non-money bill and non-finance related legislation matter, and that is on this bill. It's the first time ever. It's never been done before. The reason we did that was because there are certain constitutional mandates that if a parliament requests the FFC to do a presentation on, and if it relates to things like responsible financing and the fiscus, they must come do such presentations. On the 20th of March, the independent calculations of the FFC based on the source documents of DBE confirmed this bill will at a minimum cost 17.7 billion. When these calculations that you want, that is also in the section on financial implications of the bill that was tabled. If you open the bill right now, part of the bill when you go to the section of financial implications that is part of the bill that must be tabled with the bill for the implications of its costing it's going to get you to 17.7 so that's your second source the third source is on the meeting with us on the 22nd of march we called the dbe and the dbe itself presented calculations to us on the 22nd of march now the 22nd of march and i don't want to be wrong here, but that is essentially tomorrow would be a full three weeks ago. This bill, yes, it was tabled many, many, many months and years ago, whatever, but three weeks ago, less than three weeks ago, the DBE confirmed that at the very least, we're going to be spending 17.7 billion. So whether you are saying the 70% is in the system or not is irrelevant to the fact that provinces 
in its totality are going to need 17.7 billion rand for the bill. If you divide that by nine, we are not talking in, and it was also confirmed that the other matters that the FFC was raised was not costed for, which means that the bill itself in its financial implications is incorrect. Then if you take the norms of standards of one to 35 learners, and if you take the average by us of one to 29 learners, then the one to 40 that was confirmed by DBE in its calculations is also not sufficient. This is all information from the DBE that has come out in our February and our March um, meetings. So whether it's 30% or 40% or 50% is irrelevant to the fact that the full amount that you're asking for is 17.7 .7 billion rand without the additional costing. If you divide that by nine, you get just under 2 billion rand. We now hear that in the Western Cape, for example, and I don't know whether you've done this exercise with other provinces, and they really should have if they have not. But essentially in the Western Cape, we do not have 2 billion rand per year for the next three years, which will essentially be 6 billion. So you are asking the legislatures and the national government, as you rightly are doing so, you are asking us permission for this money. Once we give you permission, if we do so, that ends up on National Treasury's desk. That will end up on Mrs. De Brain's desk. Mr. Brain is then going to be like, OK, she needs to now go and find 17.7 .7 billion rand because the national parliament, which consists of the NA and the NCOP, as well as the nine provinces that have to vote on this legislation based on Section 76 of the Constitution, has said this is what we want. We are making this a law. And in terms of the law, we must follow what is said. And then in the end of the day, the Auditor General, based on national legislation of the Auditor General, is going to come. And I see Mr. Lucas, they are also in the meeting from, D, from WCED, from us, from Education Department. The Auditor General is then going to come and say to the Western Cape Education Department, why did you not spend 2 billion rand per year on the implementation of this bill because you have now additional obligations upon you? Because, for example, ECD is now not voluntary anymore. It is compulsory. So it becomes a thing you must do. Not may, it becomes a thing you must do. So essentially, there is no money. What you're asking from provincial legislatures in the nine votes of the mandating act for the National Council of Provinces to vote on is to vote on a matter where there is no money, where nothing has been committed and nothing has been planned for. And the money that you have costed, you as DBE have confirmed is incorrect. That is essentially what you're asking. I, I need you to understand what you are asking of us. You are asking us to give you a blank check on a bill that is incorrect. And then what essentially you are also asking us to do is you're asking us to make it national treasury and provincial treasury's problem to go find the money. And DBE is just going to wash its hands off an onskult. That is essentially what you are asking of us. Do you think that is fair, that we must now wash our hands and say, you know what, we're going to say yes to this and it's going to become National Treasury's baby, it's going to become Provincial Treasury's baby, and they must now go sell lemonade on the streets in order to find 17.7 billion rand. Do you think that is fair, what you are asking of us? Mr. Mwedi? No, Chair, to start with, that's not what we're asking you to do. What I want to make you aware of is that whether the bill goes through or not, Grid R is provided for in primary schools and ECD centers. Nobody can dispute that. And we are saying there's inequity that's happening in the provision of grades in the system. Grade 1 to grade 7 is protected by law because it's deemed to be compulsory. Grid R is not. 
And that's why grid R is actually funded at 70%. Um, we, we're not saying anything that uh, a, a blank check or, or anything. Provinces are funding this, by the way. They're funding it at 70%. And uh, I wish I could get the 30% elsewhere so that grid R is brought in line with grid one to grid seven. That, that's the point that you are making. The reality is whether the bill goes through or not, provinces carry this cost. It is carried by provinces through the equitable share. And, and I hope I'm not saying this unsympathetic uh, because I'm part of the sector. I've been there. I, I was even in provinces dealing with the provision of great R through the equitable share. And we've been fighting for years that great R was brought in line with the rest of the grades. Uh, although those, those grades are not funded in full, and our argument was that at least great R must be funded at the same level as grade one, so that there's not uh, uh, inequity in terms of funding grade R, which is your lowest grade, which is important for laying a firm foundation. And what I was disputing as well, Chair, was that People were saying that there's virtually no funding for the Bella Bill. I'm saying that's not true. There's 70% funding already, but that is not full funding as required. And it leaves provinces with that uh, difference of 30%. Thank you. Mr. Mweni, you have not answered my question. Do you think it is fair for that 30% that we now have to vote on? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, the Western Cape has to sit clause by clause with its negotiating mandate to say whether or not we should say yes to this 30% that's part of the 17.7 billion. Do you think it is fair that we are going to essentially tell National Treasury, you must just go find the funding, even though we don't know where it's from? No, I cannot make that judgment call. What is fair for me is to make it R compulsory. That's what is fair. If we act in the best interest of learners, um, I think uh, what I would do, I would acknowledge the fact that there's a gap of 30%, but grid R has to be compulsory. And, and even if you don't have the money now, you can note the gap or the variance of 30% and say over time, it's only fair that grid R is funded up to 100% of what grid one is funded for, which I think is universally fair. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make a note that to my knowledge, there has been no member that's been opposed to grid R in principle. The questions have been regarding costing. Just because someone wants to do something doesn't mean that we have the money to be able to do it. And if my understanding is correct, and Mr. Brain and Ms. Pick is going to assist, needs to assist me on this, please, if I'm wrong. Once something becomes a law and it is compulsory, if it creates an obligation upon you, the Auditor General has no choice but to audit you on that matter according to what the law says. Am I correct? I'm not sure who wants to go first. Maybe Mr. Brain? Um, I don't think so, Chi. There so are many, yeah, there are because there are many, there are many programs in government that are not fully funded. The Auditor General wants to know with the funding that you've got, you are using it in accordance with the laws. It doesn't pro pronounce on the gap. Yeah. So okay. that, that that's so my understanding. Annalise, you can confirm. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Chair, that is correct. It, it does not audit on, on the gap. It does in terms of look at the amount of funding that has been appropriated um, for that specific for that specific program. Um, that's that's in terms of from the auditors. Okay. So if no money is allocated to Bella, if this is let's call it scenario one, if no money is allocated to Bella. The Auditor General would then take what the current funding is, which is claimed at 70%, and whether you are implementing 
what you need to implement in terms of the law. But the law obviously says we must make then grade R compulsory and all of these extra things need to be done to make grade R compulsory. So it's my layman's understanding then you would have to make 100% work with 70%. If there is no additional 30% funding. Um, go DG with Mwili. Mr. Mwili? No, thank you. I'm happy that uh, both national and, and provincial treasury confirmed the explanation that I gave. I gave an example of national norms and standards for school funding. We give a threshold that all provinces should meet, which the AG knows about, but not all provinces are able to meet the threshold. Some are funding below the norm, below the threshold. They have not been qualified for that. And I can even give you the names of the provinces. It's more than one. So the 30% gap would mean that grid R would be funded below what the law requires that it should be funded. Thank you. OK, it's it doesn't relate to my question, but thank you for the extra information. My question is, if we don't get the 30 percent funding, does that mean we would have to implement 100 percent of the law based on the current clauses with the 70 percent that we have? That is the question. If I'm wrong, you must please correct me, but I just need to know if the 30% is not given to us and the law is implemented, does that mean we have to do 100% with the 70%? Um, Mr. Brain? Uh, no, I don't think that is the expectation. Um, as DJ Mwili has explained, the are many laws in education that require and are compulsory by, by, by its nature to be implemented, and they are not fully implemented. So my assumption would be that once the bill is passed, if it gets passed in this form, uh, DBE will come back into the budget process, make a further request, and that will go through the whole process as I've described it in that second slide. And the politicians, both in the executive and in the legislature, will have to make their choices. And I think for most things in education, it's been a, a phased in approach. Um, I don't think the the um, the idea is that, I mean, for example, Chi, you are not going to spend 12 billion rand on building ECD facilities in in one year. If you if you if you get X amount, you will phase your your building and your teaching staff, and, and that's how you will go. That is how I would understand it. So I don't think the expectation is there that you will do have to do 100% with only 70% of the money, as you as you put it. But DJ Mwili can, can explain further. Mr. Mwili? Yeah, no, Chair, I fully agree with uh, Mr. Brain. It depends on the Provincial Executive Council and uh, the uh, Provincial Legislatures and uh, the National Executive Council and the National Legislature. If they want to take money from somewhere over time, like they have done, I mean, money has been taken from education and the social sector. It has been taken to other sectors, maybe to build roads and so on. Uh, that we know about. If the view of the Provincial Executive Council and the legislature is that Grid R is a priority, uh, they would find a way to redirect money towards Grid R. And I don't expect the 30% to be met within one financial year. It would be unreasonable. And I also agree that uh, the bulk of that money, quite honestly, would go towards infrastructure because the practitioners are there, the LTSM is there, 
Uh, personnel is your cost driver number one. Uh, LTSM is, is your cost driver, um, I think, number two, if not number three. Infrastructure, I think it should be number two or number three. And therefore, if two of the cost drivers are already met from the baseline, uh, what you are left with in the main is uh, the, the outlay of infrastructure which is a capital investment, even if you are given that money within this financial year, as Mr. Brain has indicated, there's no capacity in the sector to be able to spend that money. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hear what is happening in real time. I, I get that. Essentially, what I'm hearing is that just because something's going to become low doesn't mean it's going to be exactly implemented like that. And Perhaps it's just me, but I consider that bad lawmaking. Making a law so that you're not planning appropriately for it. I consider that bad lawmaking. Members, are there any other questions? If none, I just want to check if there are anything out, um, from Provincial Treasury or WCED. Jen, nothing from okay. the provincial treasury. Thanks. No problem. WCED, is there anything? Uh, Ms. Coleridge Sills? Um, I think it's yes. Advocate Coleridge, uh, actually. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, from the WCED, I think uh, we concur with the issues raised by the Chair. Um, it is problematic for us in terms of budgeting, especially you know, the building of the classrooms, the maintenance costs, municipal costs, and uh, costs for educators and non-educators. We're also looking at the the policy priorities, um, the poor, pro poor policy priorities like um, food, nutrition, uh, learner transport, hostel accommodation, and so forth. So these are all factors, um, also learner transport, um, all factors that we are looking at, and obviously um, we are concerned uh, in um, providing the necessary services to our learners, and um, the budget issue is a real and a issue that we are grappling with for grade R, and we are looking at um, where uh, DVE could, for instance, say that grade R will be implemented incrementally. That was one of the suggestions we had made in our submissions uh, to the committee uh, through our Mr. Ian de Vega. Um, and uh, so just in terms of budgeting, you know, we think that this is obviously um, premature and we have to get ready to actually have a grade R universal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Member Paul. Thank you, Chair. Chair. Listening to uh, Ms. Lynn, uh, I became more concerned, concerned uh, out of a political side, uh, is how can, how will this expectation, as we have a lot of angry parents in different uh, hearings we have over the Western Cape, who have the same concerns as you as a chairperson and many others. And how will that be uh, through public participation conveyed to them that yes, this bill become compulsory for, for the great arts, but yes, we have a gap, uh, a gap of 30% into the budget. What will be the expe expectation be out there to the parents it's, it's law, it's bill now, and we have to comply to that bill. They are not interesting of a gap for that matter, and who can going to transfer that message to the angry people? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member Poole. That is a question for us as members for tomorrow that we will have to sit with the negotiating mandate on how we feel about the various clauses and ultimately the bill because people have made submissions and we have heard presentations, expert and otherwise, and we will have to apply our minds as to whether we agree with 
saying yes to 17.7 billion rand, excluding the additional costs upon a formula of one to 40 learners. That is something as members, as lawmakers, that we will have to consider tomorrow, not just as every provincial legislature and ultimately parliament will have to consider whether to say yes or no. And as members, we need to apply our minds and we need to meaningfully consider all of the respective information. Um, so that will essentially be up to us. But it is very concerning. I just want to check if there are any other hands. I don't see any hand functions or purple bubbles going up. If none, then that brings us to the end of the respective meeting. Um, it would have been advantageous to have had the minister here because some of the respective questions that are posed are more political in nature. And as the political principle of the National Treasury, it's more appropriate for, for him to answer. Although we are getting to our negotiating mandate tomorrow, so there is, we're running out of time in, in this regard. With that, I'm going to excuse um, the respective departments. And um, I just want to say thank you for being here with us today. It is a very difficult and long journey that we have walked, but it is important that members have all of the important information that is required in order to be able to satisfy ourselves on what this bill means, not just on paper, but in reality, but also what we may be saying yes or no to. We must be absolutely clear what we are deciding on. And for that, I thank you for assisting us in answering all of our questions. You may go um, on with your day-to-day -day activities. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Chair. Thank you for the Thanks. privilege. Thank you to members. Thank, thank you so you much. Okay. Members, if you can just stay online, I just want to check with Mr. Daza if um, there's anything for tomorrow that I must just um, assist with. Tomorrow, members, just um, I'll start so long. Tomorrow, for those who have not been in a negotiating mandate process before, what I'll essentially do is I will take the members clause by clause through the respective um, clauses of the bill, essentially. And if there are members that wish to make um, proposed amendments, please do come prepared for that. It is also advantageous if members could send in their proposed amendments um, even beforehand to Mr. To is it to Ms. Kamish? Oh, sorry, I'm getting confused between my different Wasim Ms. Hassan Musa. Mr. Daza, must we send it in to Ms. Hassan Musa? Yes, Chair. They, they can be sent to uh, Sima Musa, yes, Chair. Yes. For those who know, don't know, she, uh, Mr. Daza is assisting us today because it's Eid. It's my understanding. Yes, Chair. Got it, Chair. Yes. Yes, they're not online, but if, if you want to send them a message, please do. Um, so we will be going clause by clause. Please send in your respective proposed amendments to Ms. Hassan Musa. Um, you can also bring those respective members to the committee. And then at the end, we will consider the bill in its totality. Um, whether we get through everything, obviously, will depend on how many amendments members bring or not bring. Mr. Daza, if there's anything else that I'm supposed to, um, has the matrix been sent to us yet? The full matrix. I know that uh, Wasima has finished the matrix. I'm sure she should have sent it to I can just check with her if she has sent it. To, but uh, we've requested her to just ensure that it reaches the mem members as soon as possible. OK, if that could just be sent to us as soon as possible, because the members can have some late night reading to to conclude before tomorrow in terms of the matrix. I also just want to check, are we required to go through the matrix individually? Because mm. I'm not, I highly doubt we will be able to get through 5,445 submissions in a negotiated mm. mandate process. Yes, not necessarily. I think the members can just keep the, the matrix in mind and the inputs given by the public during the public participation process in deciding on whether to 
propose amendments or even deciding on the provincial stance on the bill. So those are just assisting documents for members just when they have to vote or propose amendments. They don't have to go each, each, uh, to, to deal with each um, presenter to deal with each, each submission. Okay. Personally, what I tend to like to do is I... For my personal notes, if if someone just agrees or disagrees but doesn't bring an amendment, I I tend to collate. Um, I just want to check Miss Angela has her video on. You can just put your video off, Miss Angela. Thank you. Um, personally, I usually collate where there's non-amendments, and then I make notes myself regarding how people felt or the input that they made on a particular clause or how it would be implemented or how they think it might affect them. And then I usually keep the submissions that propose amendments separately so that I can look at those when it comes to um, our own suggestions. And that's just a personal process that I usually follow. I'm not sure if that might be useful to other members. Okay, so that's so just from a procedural point of view, Mr. Daza, have I forgotten anything for tomorrow morning? No, I think we've covered everything. Just to add that even tomorrow we still have a negotiating mandate. Says the committee can still raise issues with uh, when it comes to this bill. It doesn't only have to be a uh, proposed amendment. If the committee can okay. still uh, raise whatever it wishes to raise based on the information that the committee has had after it has submitted the provisional mandate, which we did last week. Okay, okay. Um, just from a legal perspective, Advocate Marcel, if there's anything that I've forgotten that I should be mentioning now before the negotiating mandate. Bonnie Chepperson, um, from my perspective, I don't think there's anything that uh, piques my attention at the moment. Uh, on the substantive issues, I'm eager to see what the members come up with as far as proposals for amendments, if any, uh, are concerned. Uh, in respect of the totality of the lawmaking process and the satisfaction of the financial implications, I think the committee has certainly ticked this box so that that part of the process is uh, fully complied with as well. The, the, the specificities of the financial implications, of course, is not my concern. I think it's beyond my capacity. But uh, legally and the substantive issues, um, I'm satisfied, Chairperson, that the issues are addressed. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Members, are there any resolutions before I end off? If none, no, then no happy... Chair, sorry, 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 Chair, no, Chair, I will raise my concerns tomorrow in the meeting. No problem. And then with that, I hope you have a wonderful reading day. With that, the meeting is adjourned.